Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know if you saw the still photo they put up, but I'm wearing the same jacket. <laughs> and it's not a coincidence. It's actually the jacket I wore on election night. So it's kind of my good luck jacket. So anyway, um, so thank you so very much. Uh, it is always great to be able to join this event. And I'm especially humbled to see this year uh, a dynamic, brilliant young leader like Representative Carlos Guillermo Smith receive an award that I am so humbled to have had named in my honor. Um, what an honor it is for me to be associated with him and with all of you who are such great leaders across this nation, but join us here this, uh, this afternoon. Of course, I have been honored to call many of you friends and allies for a long, long time. In fact, as I shared with the elected officials this morning, I attended the second annual gathering of LGBTQ leaders back in 1986. Wow shortly after I was first elected to the Dane County Board of Supervisors. Now back then there were about 14 of us and the conference functioned pretty much as a support group, not the professional networking opportunity that it is today. And we could call ourselves even at that point international because we had one member of the British Parliament join us that year. Uh, but after all, in that er era, if you were an LGBTQ elected official, you were often the first member of our community to hold that particular office. And most likely, you were the only one serving on that board or in that legislative body. Just being there was a huge and significant victory. Well, I hope you look around. I hope you look around right now. And don't just look at our numbers. Look at the leadership roles that we're taking on, on issues ranging from health care to energy policy to foreign policy. The cause of elevating LGBTQ leaders is no longer just about the history we make when we win. It's now about the difference these leaders make for so many people's lives. And that's not to say that representation no longer matters. The gentlewoman from Virginia, Delegate-elect Rome, and wow, is that ever fun to say. Uh, she, she's. She's going to be a fantastic representative for families in her district and a leader on issues like infrastructure and health care. But it still means something more that she's there. It still means something to have members of this community in positions of power. For one thing, representation opens doors. And those doors tend to stay open. I may be the first out LGBTQ member of the United States Senate, but I know for sure that I won't be the last. And I have a hunch, I have a hunch that the next is somewhere at this conference. Representation gives us role models and paves pathways to power for the next generation of leaders. But representation is also how we ensure a seat at the table for our communities and the issues that affect us most. Now, many of you have long worked aside with me on priorities like the Equality Act, 
which would protect LGBTQ Americans from discrimination in employment, housing, ed education, public accommodations, and other arenas. You've helped me with the Tyler Clementi Higher Education Anti-Harassment Act, which would protect LGBTQ students from cyberbullying and other forms of harassment. The Therapeutic Fraud Prevention Act, which would put an end to so-called conversion therapy. And, and, and the LGBT Elder Americans Act, which would make more services available for our older adults. Many of you have long stood with me to support LGBTQ rights in court cases and in the fight against nominees of this president who are openly hostile to our community and to demand that the executive branch use its power to advance the cause of equality. But the, the, the representation that we fought for and won over the course of a generation all over the country, up and down the ballot, means that we no longer have to stand alone. Back when I was just getting started, even introducing a piece of legislation to address the concerns of the LGBTQ community, let alone finding a single straight co-sponsor, was a milestone. I mean, it really was. And that's changed. For example, in 2008, when Barack Obama ran on a promise to sign the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act into law, we got it passed through the House with 249 votes, including 18 Republican votes, and through the Senate with 63 votes, including five Republican votes. And whether it's equality in health care, equality at the workplace, or yes, equality in marriage, LGBTQ equality is no longer just seen as an LGBTQ issue. Straight leaders aren't just joining our fight out of sympathy. They're joining us because they recognize it as essential to a broader cause of fulfilling our nation's promise. More and more with every passing year, Americans understand that our fight is about freedom. It's about fairness and it's about opportunity for all. That is a triumph of, of representation, and its progress is something that we can all celebrate. Still, we cannot mistake progress for victory. We have achieved so much, so quickly, during the eight years of Obama's presidency. But those of us who have been in this movement a long time know that it hasn't always been like that. Let's be clear about what we're up against here. With President Trump in the White House, the progress we've made over the course of a generation is going to remain under attack. And our definition, our very definition of victory is gonna to have to change. I've been working with our allies to protect the gains that we've made standing up to the Trump administration's efforts to roll back protections for students, undermine the rights of transgender service members, and give religious organizations a license to discriminate against LGBTQ Americans, often with taxpayer dollars. We aren't going to win all of these fights. And it's probably going to be a while before the next time we can all gather and celebrate a signing ceremony in the Oval Office at the White House. But we cannot, we cannot throw up our hands in frustration. Many of us have 
slog through some very, very tough times. We've had moments where progress seemed impossible, and we endured them, and we must endure now. And the truth is that while what we're seeing from the Trump administration is often discouraging, what we're seeing happen around the country couldn't be more inspiring. A generation from now, when this conference is needing to be held at even a bigger arena or hotel, and you award some brilliant young leader with the very first Danica Rome Breakthrough Award, <laughs> any, any progress that Trump manages to erase will have been won back, and then some. And when we look back, when we look back at this moment, and we will remember this moment, not for the way that hatred and bigotry fueled his rise, but the, for the way that love and compassion helped our movement grow. Not just bigger, but stronger. <laughs> stronger, stronger because we became more diverse, elevating leaders of color and looking for representation in places that we once wrote off as hostile territory. Stronger because we found common cause with other communities being targeted by this administration. Religious minorities, immigrants, the working poor. Stronger because just as we once drew inspiration from the civil rights movement, our movement stood as a role model for other communities that were seeking their own voice their own representation, their own seat at the table. Stronger because we refused to back down. Stronger because we refused to be silenced. Stronger because even in the face of this difficult political moment, we refused to shrink from our calling to pass on to the next generation a country that is more equal, not less. We have stood together for a long time, and I am so proud to have made this march to progress with you. We've come so far. We have earned more power than we could have ever imagined. And now is the time to know your power to share our power, and to grow our power as we move forward together. Thank you so much for all you do.